Okay, everyone, we're down to our last panel, and then it's happy hour. Um, so this one is balancing investment and risk management. We have Avi Feldman, who's from Golden Tree Asset Management. We have Jeff Dorman, who's from ARCA. Matthew Shapiro from Multicoin Capital. Shalang from Ledger Prime. And our CEO, once again, Rain Steinberg. Hello. Jeff Dorman, report to the podium, please. Oh. Is Shalang on? Yeah. Okay. Should we introduce ourselves or? Rain Steinberg, CEO and uh, co-founder of ARCA, moderating. Let's just go down the line. Hey guys, I'm Avi Feldman. I'm the head of digital asset trading over at uh, Golden Tree Asset Management. Uh, hey everyone, I'm Matt Shapiro. I'm a partner at Multicoin Capital. Hi, Jeff Dorman, Chief Investment Officer at ARCA. Okay, um, when we contemplated this panel uh, and this entire conference, uh, it was a different world. Uh, we're talking about valuation metrics and things like that. I think let's go to risk signals and how we think about risk in the world. Who wants to take that first? I think uh, crypto is kind of a, an, an, an interesting beast when it comes to risk because you have all these different traditional ways of assessing risk in the, in the, in the regular markets that don't necessarily apply in the same way in the, in the crypto markets. I mean, one... One, one great example of this is, you know, we, uh, we actually are, are, are just spinning up uh, over, over the last couple, couple of months our digital asset uh, trading and we're porting over a lot of the infrastructure that we're taking from the traditional side. And, you know, one of the, one of the simplest things that you can do is you look at the diversity in your, in your portfolio, you look at all the different assets you hold and you think about, okay, well, what are, what are the different betas of these assets? Like if, if asset A does this and asset B does that, then what's asset C going to do in that certain scenario? And you look at the crypto markets and you think to yourself, okay, well, maybe I can do that here. And what you realize very quickly is that a lot of these assets are, are highly, highly correlated. Um, and sometimes betas, you know, an asset will go in one direction and it'll, there'll, there'll be another asset that's completely uncorrelated with it. And then three weeks later, they're going to be perfectly correlated. And so the betas are a lot more, uh, you know, uh, flexible in, in crypto than they are in the traditional markets. So that, that's kind of just one example of how malleable risk metrics are in crypto. And so a lot of the ways that you have to approach it are, 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 are novel, right? You, you have to start classifying, uh, okay, well, what is, what, is, uh, what is the type of asset that I'm holding? How do I think it's going to react in, 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 cer in certain regimes and really think you know, holistically about uh, what, are the, what are the drivers of each asset and adjust for the fact that you can't necessarily just rely on simple quantitative frameworks because those quantitative frameworks are reliant on you know, one to two years of data at best in current market structure. And you have to think to yourself, hey, well, if I'm only relying on a few different sample data points and I have to think about this really holistically. So there are a couple of different, you know, tricks of the trade that we can, we can definitely get into on the panel. But I think, um, you know, a, a qualitative assessment and quantitative assessment is a lot more important in uh, crypto risk management than it is in traditional risk management, where you can use a lot of just hard quantitative metrics to assess the risk of your portfolio. And so that's you know one of the newer ways that we're approaching the the crypto market. And I think that requires a, a pretty deep understanding of of crypto assets. And if you don't have that, then it's a little bit a little bit tricky to assess your risk. Well, I, I think I mean you're you're absolutely 100 percent spot on. But I would add to that that um, there's a, there's a big difference between first of all the risk is more than just price, right? So in this space, you also have risk of every single counterparty is brand new as well. The exchanges are brand new. The funded admins are brand new. The custodians are brand new. So, you know, that's a whole other story, but there's, there's, there's risks beyond just the price of these assets that also require a lot of due diligence in the space. It's not two guys in a Bloomberg where you just plug into your prime broker, you hit go and you're in business. Um, there's a tremendous amount of operational due diligence that goes into the space. But in terms of price, I think what Avi's saying about the correlations being malleable is, is really important, right? I mean, I've written about this space every week for four plus years now. I've written about the correlation to 
the Chinese yuan to gold, to the US dollar, to equities, to even avocados, right? The, the data changes constantly. Um, so you can't be too wedded to some of those inputs. Um, but also you have, to, you have to really separate the difference between price risk versus business risk. Meaning let's take what happened to Bill Wang at Arkegos Capital, for example. You know, he owned a lot of different stocks, things like Viacom and Baidu. The businesses of those companies do not have any correlation whatsoever. But the price of the stocks had very heavy correlation when one person decided to sell them all at once because of a leveraged margin call, right? The price risk became very correlated. The business risks of the underlying companies were not. The same thing is true in what Avi was referring to is that right now the price risk, the correlation is one in all digital assets, right? No matter what you are, if you're wrapped in a digital asset wrapper, you are being viewed as the same risk. But there's a big difference between say five companies or projects that are 100% reliant on Terra Luna. And therefore when Terra Luna goes down, those five businesses fundamentally also go down versus two projects where have totally different uh, inputs and outputs to the success and failure of that business. But right now the price just happens to be trading together. So separating out those inputs and those outputs is also really important, right? What is, you know, why are we able to call a healthcare stock defensive versus like a tech stock, right? Because we have hundreds of years of history of the fact that healthcare companies the demand for healthcare doesn't go down because of recession, right? We don't have that data in a lot of cases of digital assets. In some cases we do. You know, we know that for instance, something like Ethereum has very different inputs and outputs to success and failure than something like Bitcoin. Totally different business models, price very correlated right now. So the, the, you have to be cognizant of, of what you're actually trying to assess when you look at risk in this space. Yeah, I think, I think you have to know what you're underwriting. I think co correlations quantitatively are, are one thing, but Crypto is very nascent and everything else is nascent and it's open and it's composable, which in many ways is the greatest feature. In other ways, it creates, you know, in some forms, multiplicative risk if you're, if you're not really sure what you're underwriting. And so if you have a layer of the stack here and a layer of the stack here and a layer of the stack here, you know, if you're investing up here, you sort of may think, oh, I'm investing in this sort of like business model, you know, sort of like Jeff was saying. But if that business model is entirely dependent on everything else, it kind of could look like Jenga. And so you really need to understand what are the true multiplicative layers of risk that you're taking to the extent that you are? And like, how do they correlate? And what is like the path dependency of all of these assets? You know, they're all very young at the end of the day. Um, there's a chance they all collide into each other, you know, depending on, you know, how, how the markets play out. And so I think you really have to step back and like really have a thesis of uh, and understand truly what you're underwriting and like, what are the key inputs and constantly test against those inputs to make sure that the thesis is intact. Um, and I think it comes down to that also like rolls into obviously portfolio construction. Like it's okay to have, you know, we have like very pointed views in some aspects of this space, like smart contract protocols. Um, we're comfortable with that. That's what we do. We like it. But there's other ways in the portfolio to sort of diversify that risk, you know, and other assets that are Web3 that are maybe more chain agnostic. And so when you look at the overall portfolio, you get uh, ways to express your perspective um, and do so in the way that you want, but also do it, you know, from a risk adjusted basis. Thanks. Uh, Shalang, do you have anything to add there? Yeah, I would just, you know, completely agree with everyone. I think, um, you know, for us, we're a little bit different from, from some of the other you know, investors and in funds here, right? We're, we approach it more from a quantitative and systematic approach. And, and I would say that um, the, the point I would make is like, one, there, there's, you know, we, we probably touch like the longer tail of assets and, and tokens than, you know, everyone else um, you know, on this panel. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's 20,000 tokens. Um, I think we'll probably discuss later on this panel that a lot of them do have value and, and there's, you know, great ways to kind of value it. Um, but also the vast majority of the 20,000 tokens are probably worthless. And so when we approach a space, we, you know, when you're trading or touching, you know, these assets and the majority of them probably are worthless, we think of it more from just a pure liquidity perspective, right? Like it becomes a player versus player um, kind of mentality. Like where is the liquidity? How is everyone positioned? Because if we're touching all these assets that fundamentally probably don't have any value, then we don't really care about the fundamentals. We just care how every single else, you know, every single other investor, every single other trader um, is basically positioned and where the liquidity gaps are, right? And so for us, um, we really, really care about um, liquidity gaps, liquidity pockets, um, leverage, open interest, order book, et cetera, et cetera, across kind of the landscape. And uh, that, that's something that, that we really monitor, um, you know, extremely closely. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's gonna be very different for fundamental investors, VC investors, long short investors, um, just because we, we touch so many other assets. But, you know, th those are some of the things that, that we'll look at and really pay attention to. Thanks. All right. So we touched on risk here and we'll come back to that, but maybe we just in the 
the current market environment, I jumped ahead to that, but you talked about portfolio construction, how you classify these assets and how you look at the space. Um, how do you bucket this and think about portfolio construction and that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm laughing because the space evolves so fast and I should, I should probably have a better answer to this, but like the space is at this point, it's not that dissimilar to the S&P 500. It's not nearly as mature. There's not nearly as many companies, but you are starting to see segmentation across the entire crypto landscape of things that are just mutually exclusive and very different from one another. Um, the way that sort of, you know, at least I think about it is, you know, I think about smart contract platforms as sort of like the base layer. They enable, you know, a ton of innovation and infrastructure on top. From there, you know, I generally bucket into sort of open finance, which, which I would categorize as sort of like, you know, DeFi, um, anything that's facilitating financial transactions, removing um, excessive fees, pushing value back out to the edges of a network, right? All of that fits in what I would call open finance. Everything else kind of fits in, you know, Web3, which is like building tech infrastructure that's decentralized. You're not relying on Amazon. You're not relying on sort of the Web2 companies, but you're building this entire stack, you know, in a, in a decentralized way, sort of from the ground up. Um, and then within each of those two, like you could break it down into lots of different areas, right? Like open finance is, you know, do you have stable coins, units of account, execution layer, oracles, borrow lend protocols, yield aggregators, right? There's all these different layers within open finance. Within Web3, you have the same thing, right? You have file storage, you have query layers, you have private key management, right? There's all these segments of the of the of the uh, segments of the of that market that are all sort of coming together in their own unique ways. And then on top of that, you're starting to see like what I would call like applied infrastructure, although there should probably be a better name for it, which is things that like are hard to bucket, right? But they're solving real world problems by leveraging all the tech underneath it in those two categories, right? Things like Helium, things like Audius, things like Brain Trust, um, where you're starting to see more consumer facing applications that are leveraging either all or some portion of this decentralized infrastructure that's being built. And like that is continuing to scale horizontally, it's continuing to scale incredibly fast. Uh, because of composability, um, which makes it like a hard question to answer of like, how do you bucket it? Because like, maybe that's not the right way to bucket it today. And it may not be the right way to bucket it tomorrow because of how fast things change. Yeah, I'd, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd hop on that last point and say that it's becoming increasingly difficult to actually bucket specific, uh, you know, companies, protocols, tokens, uh, because the beauty of crypto is that so much of it is open source. Basically, all of it should be. And that means that there's infinite leverage. If, you, if you're running a borrow lend protocol and you want to go add an exchange to your borrow lend protocol, you can go do that pretty quickly and pretty easily. And so what I'm actually seeing is I'm seeing a lot of projects, you know, pivot, change, something that might be an exchange one day will be a borrow lend and exchange another day. In fact, recently had a conversation with an exchange that looked at me and said, hey, what do you think uh, about building our own L1? Because now L1s are easy to develop with, you know, caught the Cosmos SDK with, with AVAX subnets. And so what you're seeing is you're seeing a lot of experimentation happening in crypto. You're seeing a lot of, you know, what, what actually used to be more siloed buckets sort of wrap into each other because of the fact that it's so easy to create, create things in crypto because of the tremendous amount of leverage. You're, right? ba you're basically describing vertical integration, like immediate Correct. vertical integration. Correct. That's and that's I think that that's what's happening in crypto and, and people are people are trying out different ways to, to vertically integrate and some are being successful and, and some aren't. But I'll say that I, I've definitely over the last six months seen a trend towards a lot more malleability around what people are building, whether it's, you know, oh, originally, you know, I'm building a DeFi project now it's I'm building a DeFi project with an L1 attached to it. And, you know, I think that there are still a bunch of really difficult tech problems that we can solve in crypto. And so, you know, there are still silos because it's, it, it still is difficult to build an extremely scalable L1 from scratch. That's, that's a very difficult thing to do, but I'm seeing a lot of, uh, you know, bucket overlap these days. I, I think even though you guys both painted a picture of kind of a broad based industry, I actually think you guys didn't even go broad enough in the sense that like I'm, I'm a former fixed income investor, right? If you guys have ever, have ever read the Frank Fabozzi handbook of fixed income, you know, it's 1450 pages that will put you to sleep because it is so much going on in the bond market from who's the issuer type. Is it a government, a muni, a corporate, uh, you know, what type of bond is it from a rating standpoint, investment grade down to high yield? Is it a callable, a puttable, a convertible, a preferred, uh, you know, does it have negative covenants? There's all these different factors that goes into fixed income. The same thing is now true of digital assets. You start, first have to start with a much broader taxonomy before you can get down to the sectors and the buckets, meaning who is the issuer of a token? It can be an individual, a person. 
It can be a decentralized autonomous organization. It can be a corporation. It can be a government. Then where do you fall on the, on the spectrum from fully decentralized to fully centralized or somewhere in between to what type of token is it? Is it a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin or, or all the Bitcoin forks? Uh, or is it a asset backed token? Or is it a hybrid pass through token where some form of cash flows and revenues get distributed back to token holders as well as some form of you know, member benefit or loyalty reward that comes with being a participant in the network? Um, and then you get into the sectors. Um, you know, I'm a big believer, as much as we were just talking about the tech here, I, I think every single company or organization in the world is going to have a token in the next five to 10 years. I think Disney will have a token and that token will give you your Disney plus access, plus your fast pass access at the park, plus, you know, rights to certain IP and content. Starbucks is going to have a token. Netflix is going to have a token. New York City is going to have a token. You know, that token is going to fund projects instead of revenue bonds and go bonds. Uh, and if you have that token, you might get discounts on the subway or fast track at the airport or you know access to certain events at you know central park i think every university is going to have a token your kids going to be born you're going to buy you know and what you're going to buy nyu token and in 18 years if they don't go to nyu they're going to trade it for duke token um like that's where we're headed and that has nothing to do with technology that has to do with the token structure itself is the greatest capital formation and customer bootstrapping mechanism that we've ever seen and it fully aligns all stakeholders so I, again, I think you know the book on digital assets is going to be 1,450 pages long, and it's going to start way further back than the sector bucketing. Anything add to that, Shalang? Um, Yeah, just quick. Uh, I would say like the, the reason why you're asking this question of like why we need to like sectorize and bucket things is you know pro probably like just bring it back to like you know risk management, right, and, and kind of understanding. Um, I mean, people like to categorize things and, and kind of pattern match. Um, but I'll add like, you know, taking the simple example, like bar and lend platforms, right? There's multiple bar and lend projects and like every single layer of one now, but they are all kind of behaving differently from a price um, and risk perspective, right? Risk returns, et cetera. And the reason ultimately I think comes down to my first point is, is ultimately depends on who the holders of the tokens are, the, the stakeholders, investors, um, and like the liquidity of all these projects, right? So I think um, as we're trying to like, you know, buck in and, and assess the landscape of like a lot of these really kind of copy paste, like same projects across the ecosystem, but, but they all kind of behave a, a bit differently. And, and the reason I think ultimately kind of comes down to just um, really the holders and, and liquidity of, of these kind of, you know, different projects. I want to I want to spend like two two more seconds on this topic because yes. I think Go. there's a couple more interesting things to say here, and uh, I'd be curious to get your guys' take on this. But I think you know concretely, if you want to take away something from this, hey, I'm looking at an asset. How how should I how should I think of it? I think that there are a couple different ways that these things tend to accrue value to kind of wrap your heads around tokens. One is you know the monetary premium value assigned to a token, and that's something like a Bitcoin that people like it because it has some sort of monetary value associated with it because other people tend to value it highly, right? So that's, you can think of it as, as a currency. There are things that, you know, Jeff, Jeff has pointed out uh, that give you access to different things that the company can give to you. So if you have a Disney token, you might get access to Disney Plus. Or if you have, uh, you know, uh, a crypto token, you might get access, a crypto.com token, you might have access to a tickets at the crypto.com stadium. So that's sort of an access point, right? So that's where some of the value comes from comes from. And then the third is, you know, revenues. A lot of these tokens do act like traditional equity where you get, you know, you, you can get a dividend. It's associated with the future cash flows of that protocol. And so I think if you're, you know, from a really high level, there are all sorts of different types of projects and all sorts of different types of things that you can build and all sorts of different types of things that you can do. But those are probably the three categories in my mind that stick around of how you should actually think about these, how these things accrue value, the monetary premium, the access to different rewards, and then also the access to cash flows. Okay. In this diverse realm of, you know, all these different tokens and all these different ways to value them in this environment where we just talked about correlations approaching one amongst these, how do we look at this in this, you know, diverse things with all these different value propositions in this type of environment? Well, I mean, look, we all turn into short-term traders during times of market duress, right? you do have to separate the players from the assets, right? The assets themselves may not be highly correlated just because the investors who are in them are now making highly correlated decisions. So like anything in investing, it does come down to time frame. 
right? If you have a 12 month time frame, I promise you that all of these tokens are going to have different uh, risk reward uh, uh, characteristics and, and different uh, levers for their success or failure. Over the last six weeks, that has not been the case, right? Accelerated last week uh, with the events that happened in the market. So the time frame matters. Um, you know, ultimately, there is a real fundamental difference with all the different token types that we were talking about, right? If you're investing in something like Bitcoin, which is impossible to value, there is no value. It, you know, it is a call option. It's either worth zero or you know a million dollars a coin, and every dollar price along the way. It's just a probability function of whether or not it succeeds or not. There, you know, that could be correlated to a lot of different things. But if you're talking about a protocol that has real apps, I mean, the best way to think of a layer one protocol is think of it like the Apple App Store, right? On day one, it has no apps inside of it. It's just speculative value. On day, you know, 10,000, when you have thousands of apps being uh, built on there and thousands of transactions happening within there, there's real value to that App Store. That When that becomes a more mature protocol, which is, you know, certainly Ethereum right now, and then, you know, a lot nipping at Ethereum's heel in terms of uh, users and growth. Like there's real revenues, real cash flow, real business happening on there. There is a real floor and a real intrinsic value to what that is worth. Now, it doesn't mean it trades there. It can trade anywhere, but there is a real value to what that is worth. Um, you know, if it's a centralized company like a Binance or an FTX that has real revenues and real cash flows and real profits, and those profits are being distributed directly back to token holders, you can do a DCF model. You can do a dividend yield model. You can come up with exactly what that is worth um, based on the profitability of that business. Price can do whatever it wants, but the value is actually worth something. And over longer periods of time, and I can't define what that is, you know, who knows how long we're going to be in a stressed environment. Uh, you know, if you saw today, there was 1.9 trillion of reverse repo, which means that, you know, this is not a credit crisis like 08 where people don't have money. This is a market where everyone has money and nobody wants to spend it. When people start spending that money again, the value actually starts to matter again. So there is no doubt in my mind that the correlation is spurious and it will eventually uh, be dictated by real value capture. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the world is in a weird place. And I think we've seen historically, like when people panic, the correlation of almost all assets, that's assets are one, right? Cash, cash is king, people go into cash, they triage their balance sheet, and then they figure out what do we do, right? And so crypto is a risk on asset, you know, we can make an argument that Bitcoin is store of value and all these other things. Like the truth is it hasn't yet been tested. I think if it's going to shine, like this is probably the right environment, right? You got inflation, you got war literally happening, you got Fed hikes. Um, so there's a lot of different things that are, that are happening. And so I think, interestingly, not only is crypto risk on, it's also the most liquid asset that you own, right? If you own crypto and you want liquidity, like, and it's a weekend, like you could sell a billion dollars of, you know, Bitcoin or crypto at 10 o'clock at night on Saturday. I'm like, you can't do that with any other asset in the world, interestingly. Um, and for a lot of people that own crypto, like they're up. So psychologically, like it's very easy, it's easier to part with, right? Like at least from, you know, from, a, from a mental framework. The, the question is like, what happens next, right? And there's been precedent of this before. Right now, like everything's being driven by global macro until people feel comfortable. Crypto is not immune to that. But a lot of groups now have cash. What are they going to do with it? They're not going to sit in cash at 8% inflation rates. That cash gets deployed and has to go elsewhere. I think like what Jeff was saying, like, hey, here's a, an asset class that's generally historically been uncorrelated to everything else that every institution in the world is, is sort of woefully underexposed to um, if it works to any degree that we think it will. And like there's real value that's being created in ways that are uh, in, in a way that is different than the exposures that they already have, right? And so I think that I feel pretty confident over a reasonable period of time that like more people are getting interested in crypto. We see it all the time with the groups that we talk to. It, it astonishes me every day like the, the people that, you know, in our network that, that we get to talk to amongst founders, allocators, tech companies, et cetera. So like we see all of that happening and like we're just in a spot where, you know, volatility is, is high and correlations go to one, but there's plenty of historical precedent. You know, we saw with China cracking down on crypto, the entire market went down to one. That was pretty extemporaneous. It affected a bunch of Chinese, you know, miners. Um, that's mutually exclusive to Ethereum or Solana or Helium or all of these other assets that, have their own business models, their own cash flow mechanisms, et cetera. And that turned out to be a buying opportunity. COVID was the same thing, right? And so I think you're just in a weird spot today where volatility and, and panic is sort of reigning and that's causing correlations to go to one. After that, you generally see dispersion amongst returns. And I think you're going to see, you know, allocators, you know, start start putting put, putting dollars to work again in, in areas that they may not have uh, earlier. Yeah, I 100% uh, agree with both, both of what you guys said. I think, uh, I think if you look at crypto, the fact that it's considered an asset class is purely out of convenience. 
they're going to be real estate companies that use crypto and blockchain tech. They're going to be airlines that use crypto and blockchain tech. They're going to be financial companies built on crypto and blockchain tech. And the, the fact that it's considered just a single asset class and that's crypto yeah. is kind of an outdated concept. I mean, it's true now and the correlations are super high now, basically for one reason and one reason only. And that's because they have a tremendous amount of cross asset holders, right? Like if you most people that own one crypto own a bunch and they own a bunch across a variety of different industries and you know own a bunch of different cryptos that do a variety of, of, of different of different things. So in times of stress and you know when things are going up, people just kind of buy crypto because it's a new hot thing. But considering crypto an asset class of its own, I actually think is is incorrect in the in the long run. In like the next five to 10 years, what you're gonna see is you're just gonna see a lot of companies building on crypto rails that inevitably will become decorrelated over time because the reality is that they're doing completely different things, a lot of them, right? Some of them are doing very similar things, but if you look at the broad space, a lot of different things happening, right? And so, you know, I think it's kind of like looking at March, 2020, and if you know, everything's crashing, you look at Hertz and you look at a bunch of real estate and you're like, well, you know, real estate went down with Hertz. So they're basically the same thing. And that, you know, that sucks. I'm not going to buy any real estate anymore. It just doesn't really make much sense. I think you know as uh, as as the market as the market matures and people realize that these assets do very different things in, in aggregate, then they're going to start to decorrelate. But for the time being, I'm I'm happy to trade the correlations. Okay, when you think about kind of this diversity of this ecosystem, um, you see broad themes emerge, and we've seen in the past. How do you identify these themes, and how do you think about like thematic investing in this space? Like, where do you see interesting things emerging? just spend all my time on Twitter. It's where, it's where it all happens. I'm only, I'm only half kidding. <laughs> I think. Is there, there's got to be something else too. There, yeah. The, Please, rest, the, rest, the, the rest is on Telegram. Yeah. <laughs> or just um, <laughs> brutal. I, I mean, like, the, 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 as Abhi was saying a minute ago, like, it's very possible this isn't an asset class. It's very possible this is a technology that underpins all asset classes. Every equity, every debt, every real estate, every personal property, everything is going to be represented in token form at some point. Um, as a result, you know, a lot of people, especially you know, people who have already heavily invested their time and money into the space, sort of see an, an, an inevitable future, but not necessarily a clear path for exactly how you get to that future. And that's really what you're doing from a thematic investing standpoint. In the same way that, for example, if you wanted to invest in the internet in the 90s, there weren't a lot of choices, right? You largely had hardware companies, right? You had like Dell and EMC, you know, eventually then you had dot coms, right? And everybody was a internet native company, right? 20 years later, everybody's an internet company, right? Domino's Pizza is an internet company. Hertz is an internet company, right? JP Morgan is an internet company. Nobody says dot com anymore. It's just assumed that you're a dot com. We're in the early stages right now where everything that has a token is a crypto native company, right? This is still the hardware or software phase of like everything that is being built is a crypto native company. We haven't had the Disney token yet or the Netflix token yet or the Starbucks token or the NYU token or all the things we, we talked about. You know, when that happens, everybody is a blockchain company and there is no such thing as, you know, a, a crypto native company anymore. Um, as a result, what we're doing from a thematic investing standpoint is we're trying to find from a top-down thematic standpoint how do you get from where we are today to that inevitable path that we all think is coming? Um, in the last four years, there's been four real success stories, right? Bitcoin is obviously one of the success stories. Now you could argue that maybe it shouldn't have been, but it clearly is, right? I mean, it's, you know, it's almost a trillion dollar asset at one point and every single person in the world knows what Bitcoin is now. Um, stable coins went from zero AUM two years ago to 200 billion at its peak. That's a success story uh, as a theme. Um, DeFi, right, at its peak, DeFi had enough assets collectively to be the 19th largest U.S. bank. Um, that's a success story, right? Collectively, DeFi works. Uh, NFTs, love them or hate them, it's a success story. It has proven that you can put personal property uh, and art collectibles data onto blockchain in an individual form. That's a th that, so those four themes worked. The question is, what are the next themes, right? That's what everyone up here and everyone who invests time and energy and money into the space is looking for. Like, what are those themes? Um, so what we do, whether it's on Twitter or Telegram or anywhere else, like we are looking for where is the developer action? Where are people going to? Where are problems that need to be solved, right? The greatest thing about the wreckage of the last week, uh, you know, there's a real duality building here, which is like, you know, we're, we're used to moral hazard in the debt and equity world and, and the Fed put where every time there's a fire, inevitably somebody puts it out. Nobody ever puts out fires in digital assets. We just build, burn, rebuild, burn, rebuild. 
And in that rebuilding process, problems that arise get solved with the next layer of companies and tokens that get built. And that's what we thematically are looking for. All right. Uh, that sounds optimistic. I like that. Um, is there any projects and things specific that you're seeing right now uh, that you're excited about in this, uh, this bridge to the future or things that are really interesting? Chilang? Uh, well, I'll, I'll take a quick opportunity to uh, maybe fill our own incubated project called Fractal. But uh, on, a broader, <laughs> on a broader theme, I think, um, there's, I completely agree with Jeff and what else the panelists said. Right? There's a lot of value that it's being created. There's a lot of projects that can be valued using traditional valuation techniques that have real use cases, that have real cash flow. It's not just inflationary tokens that are being printed um, you know, out of thin air. Um, and so th those are the areas that, you know, themes that and broadly that, that we like to look at um, and back and support, right? We're not VC investors, but we, we will support projects selectively based on what we think the viability of the ecosystem and the project is in the long term and how it accrues value. And so, you know, for us, we, we like to look at projects that um, like, like even like all, all the, you know, options vaults or like DeFi yield um, projects, right? Like understanding like, well, where does the yield actually comes from? Is it inflationary or... Is it a different type? Is it like a transfer of risk, right? Is it like, are, are you short gamma? Are you short vol? Is it just like a transfer of beta? Um, and that's fine, right? Like as long as investors and users are honest with themselves and you know, recognize that like you're getting paid for a certain type of risk, um, then you can start to value it properly. Um, and then you can kind of, you know, basically uh, build in and support it. And, and um, but, but like, if you're, if you're just, you know, simply, um, you know, if the risk is just, if the return is just there from, from some like inflationary, um, you know, token, um, then, you know, you're not really necessarily being honest, you know, with yourself. And so for us, you know, it's, it's looking at the projects where, um, you know, the, the, the returns are, are, are kind of properly bucketed and, and assessed and analyzed um, and managed. And I think those, you know, basically what we call like real yield um, is kind of like the, the area that, that we like to focus on. I'm uh, I'm really really bullish on you know the, the new age of financial infrastructure that's being built in built in DeFi. I mean, look, uh, I I'm working at, at Golden Tree helping lead out their their digital act, asset uh, asset trading and asset investing. But Golden Tree is a 47 billion dollar asset manager. They do a ton of distressed debt. They do a ton of credit. They do a ton across the rest of the whole financial world. Crypto is just you know one one part of our of our company, and there's a ton that we can take from the traditional world and start doing in crypto and make it infinitely more efficient, right? So we're actually right now, for, as an example, we're building out a cri uh, private credit business as well. So it's like, hey, can we take a loan that we were going to do through the tra traditional plumbing, through traditional infrastructure, and actually go into DeFi and settle it through a platform like Sublime or Maple or Clearpool or one of these other, one of these other projects, right? Can we, can we go do that? And then instantly, we're able to settle that loan. We're able to securitize that loan. We're able to do whatever we want with it in a way that's a lot more efficient than what's happening in the traditional world. I mean, you know, there are weeks and weeks and weeks, months sometimes burnt on settling loans. You know, securitizing them, doing doing right. And it's it's really it, it is really complicated. And so if we can do that, but in DeFi, and not only are we being more efficient, but by using these platforms, they're actually going to give out some of their equity to us. For using them, which is which is what's happening right now, then well, that's that that that's, that's a huge win-win. Awesome. Then every everybody's aligned, and you know we're we're part of the vanguard bringing traditional finance into crypto, which is you know one of the reasons I was so excited about coming to Golden Tree. It's I mean it's it's hard not to be excited about things, so it's it's hard to pick like a specific category because there's just so much innovation that that's happening. And like Jeff was saying, I mean, and, and, and Avi, like the design space for this is is, is enormous, um, and so you get a lot of creativity behind it, but I mean, there's areas today that are pretty prevalent, right? Things like uh, creator economy, NFTs, metaverse, social tokens, gaming to some extent. Um, all of those, I would say, are totally distinct sort of segments of the market, but all highly sort of interrelated. And like, there's going to be massive venture scale outcomes when it comes to that. And I can make an argument today that like nothing has product market fit in any of them, right? We're just at the beginning. And so thinking about the path dependency of how that plays out, there's going to be huge winners as it relates to that. Like, so we spend a lot of time thinking about path dependency in those markets and how big they can get and how that's going to play out. 
Um, we spend a lot of time thinking about like, we call it proof of physical work, which is um, something I think we've leaned, leaned into sort of more, more than everybody else, which is like, how do you use tokens as the incentive model to like facilitate the build out of like physical infrastructure? So things like Helium, things like Hive Mapper, where, you know, things are naturally decentralized, uh, where a token, you know, sort of levels the playing field and allows the supply and demand side of a, you know, marketplace to effectively self-organize, right? And you can do that far more efficiently, far cheaper than a centrally top-down plan, you know, coordination effort. Um, so we're seeing that. There's not going to be a million Heliums, but there's going to be Heliums applicable to lots of different markets. And we're starting to see people see that concept make sense and see it work in real time. And that's getting the creative juices. Now we're starting to see all sorts of entrepreneurs that have nothing to do with crypto. They're not crypto native, but they have really deep domain expertise in their specific market. And they realize that like crypto is how they bend or break the rules of that marketplace. It's how they compete with an incumbent. It's how they like change the cost structure of something. And they realize that crypto is the answer to their problems. They want to work with the right people to help bring it to fruition. Like that's really exciting. I'll jump in on my own question there. I've also seen, um, even at this conference, uh, traditional insurance people. Um, you know, this is an incredible use case for it. These are incredibly risk averse investors and institutions, uh, no desire or interest really in crypto per se, but the utility of crypto uh, settlement, uh, you know, crushing transaction costs, uh, in, you know, oracles and sources of truth on this. It's, a, it's an amazing fit. And you're actually starting to see those people come into the space. So that that's the one that Jeff, Jeff's view of the world of all these companies having a token in this. It, it often seemed very far off, but I'm actually thinking um, from a lot of the stuff I've seen, we're probably a lot closer to that than I've seen at any point in the past. Um, just on, switch it up a little bit here. We've talked about the investment thesis. We spend a lot of time on uh, market structure and operations um, in this space. What do you think about, have there been changes to market structure, uh, utility of like systems and operations for your businesses? Is that improving, staying the same, even in like an environment like last week? You know, back in, uh... I prior, prior, prior to working at Golden Tree, I worked at a firm called called Block Tower, and you know I I, I joined I joined that firm in 2019, and we were pretty active traders of the markets, and let me tell you it was it's pretty difficult to get things done. It was it was it was not it was not easy. There were only a few counterparties that that, that you could use. Liquidity was extremely fragmented, and there were exactly zero qualified custodians that we really truly trusted. At the time, I mean, you know, there there were a couple that we trusted, but they weren't, you know, they didn't have all the regulatory, uh, you know, cl clearances that that we that we that we would have wanted. Fast forward to today, as we're building out our infrastructure to do this over at Golden Tree, and it's completely different. It's actually quite institutional. What I say, uh, you know, about it is, you know, the 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 three the three eyes. It's it's investable, it's institutional, and now it's inevitable. And we have all those things in the crypto market that we just did not have before. And so when I'm executing trades, when I'm trading actively, when I'm trying to make investments, we now have standards, we have good counterparties that we can trust on, we have better liquidity in the markets. But with all that said, there's still a tremendous amount of inefficiency out there, right? And the reason that there's a tremendous amount of inefficiency is because people are still scared because it's difficult, right? It's a, it's a difficult thing to wrap your head around the crypto markets. It's a difficult thing to really understand how, how the markets move and, and how they work and how you need to be trading them, trading them effectively. It's difficult from a compliance standpoint, from a regulatory standpoint, from an ops standpoint, from an accounting standpoint. But if you work hard enough, these issues are now solvable in a way that four years ago, they were almost impossible. It, it's also, I'm going to go away from trading for a second and, and even talk more about research in the sense that this is just a way better system than what we have in the debt and equity markets in the sense that remember when Lehman and Bear were going under and you're just sitting there, you know, on CNBC or refreshing, you know, CNBC.com waiting to hear what Dick Folder or, you know, some leader was going to lie to you about whether or not the bank run was happening. We just had, you know, everything's fine. Everything's fine. Our customers are going to believe in us, right? Or, or, you know, what's going on in the repo markets. You just wait for a Fed governor or treasury secretary to lie to you about what's going on. Um, we just saw a, $18 billion bank run in two days on Terra Luna on chain in real time where everybody had the same data, right? You know, earnings season just finished, right? It's, it's what, middle of May? We're finding out things that happened on January 1st. Cool. That's, you know, four and a half months later, uh, you know, or you get maybe an 8K once in a while. 
We get real-time data every single day. We had an 8K basically all day, every day in real time into what is happening with the health and, 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 uh, of these businesses and protocols that we're investing. That is a way better system. There is so much more transparency and data and information. Now, 99% of the world has no idea this exists or certainly how to access it or how to read it, but it exists, right? That's what the blockchain is. Uh, it is a transparent ledger. So, you know, we may trust the debt and equity market because it's been around for hundreds of years and we've all been conditioned to believe that that's the best system. But I can tell you, having done both for my entire career, that it is not. This is a much better system that is just not fully adopted yet. Uh, thanks for that. Um, time for questions. And if we don't, oh, we have- We solved there. blockchain. Nobody has a question. Exactly, now we have a question. Um, do you think those, like pray to on, move to on, those projects have real um, value or can survive or those will eventually all go out? 100% they have value in my opinion, basically full stop. I think that a lot of the current iterations of play to earn obviously are uh, difficult and very Ponzi-esque. But if you think about it, right, they're, they're caddies for the golf course. And when you want to go play golf, you can hire somebody to carry around your golf clubs. If you ever play video games, sometimes there are things that you, you kind of have to do in order to get to the next level that you might not want to do. And you can just pay somebody to do that. And that's actually been happening for the last 20 years in video games. And this is just a way of basically institutionalizing that, right? And making it easy and, and, and actually integrating that into the game and providing specific jobs to specific people for doing specific tasks. And, you know, I think that that's kind of, kind of here to stay. I think that the current iteration of it definitely got way overhyped and way overblown, but the concept of a job, you know, that helps other people relax better by playing video games is actually, I think, quite, quite awesome. I also argue that on-ramps into digital assets matter a ton. Um, four or five years ago, every single person who was involved in this space came through Bitcoin. They had an opinion on Bitcoin. They owned Bitcoin first. That was the only on-ramp and everything you did from there was a derivative or an offshoot of what you did with Bitcoin. You have people using, you know, step in, you know, move to earn apps. You have people using, you know, a play to earn gaming apps who don't care at all about digital assets. They don't care at all about Bitcoin. They could care less about the underlying infrastructure in the same way that when you send an email from your Gmail client to someone else's Yahoo mail client, you couldn't care less about the SMTP protocol that makes that happen. That is the kind of consumer adoption trend that makes this end up in everybody's wallet, right? Like, you know, when I got my first iPhone in 2009, I didn't care about games. But once I was in the ecosystem, Angry Birds ended up on my phone because everyone was talking about it and it was just there. The same thing is going to happen. Someone's going to use a move to earn app or a play to earn app. And once they're in the ecosystem, they're going to find out about Ethereum or Solana or about DeFi or about stable coins. And it just, it just builds on itself. So, so to have real consumer adoption with things that are not quote unquote crypto native yeah. is a huge deal. It, 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 I think it's here to stay. I think it's a great onboarding tool. It definitely will be iterated on in a positive way, but I tend to think that it's not going to be the reason that something wins. Um, I think it's going to be the reason that something wins is going to be everything else around it. And crypto is what sort of bootstraps it or puts it on steroids or, you know, really creates a network effect around it. Like the, the thing that you're doing has to have true value for you and you have to enjoy doing it. Like Axie Infinity is cool, but it's not like particularly fun. I don't, I don't know if you played it. It's not a fun game. Like, I would go so far as to call it. in other areas of the world you call work. Like, I think that's work to grind. Um, but like, it's unlocked this new behavior that I think you get more creative people to figure it out. I think there will be a game that is huge and it's a great onboarding tool and people use it and it's all driven by crypto and crypto is a key part of it. But like the game has to be fun, right? You have to have all of the traditional gaming sort of all the characteristics that make a hit game, right? Like that's got to be what it wins on. And I think crypto is sort of what takes it to the next level. I think like step in and move to earn and other things like that, like it has to be fun. People have to use it natively because they want to. And I think crypto is a big piece of it. I don't think it's the only piece that matters. Any other questions? What do you consider a good source of data that's clean? Uh, what's the kind of Bloomberg refinitive version of uh, data for crypto that doesn't have to be scrubbed or all data needs to be scrubbed and 
kind of looked at that one. I, I, I think do, I mean, we're investors at full disclosure, but like, I think Dune Analytics is one of the best platforms in crypto. Um, you obviously have to search for what you, what you want, but it gives you the ability to query things, it gives you the ability to fork things. You can pull up tons of dashboards. You can pull up dashboards that people use every day. You pull up dashboards that people are creating in real time. Like it's very community driven bottoms up. Um, incredibly, incredibly granular and real time. Like Jeff was saying, like the look that you get into these systems in real time is, is truly unparalleled relative to the status quo of every financial market and everything that exists in the, in the traditional world. Um, so I, yeah, Dune, I think Dune Analytics is, is, is by far the best. It's something that I, I literally use every day. I mean, I actually wrote a blog about this, I think six months ago, maybe we can I'll dig it up and send it to anyone who wants to see it. But like, there's a tremendous amount of information out there from Dune Analytics to the block to uh, uh, the sorry, um, to uh, uh, token terminal, token terminal is doing, you know, revenue and cash flows. Um, you know, there is basically an unlimited amount of free, actually SKU, which got bought by Coinbase is another good one, but there, there is, all the data is freely accessible to everyone, right? It, basically everybody has all of Bloomberg's data, but not everybody has figured out how to pull it all together. And that's why these different applications allow you to do it, but you know, Again, the, the, the blockchain itself is the ledger. Uh, the data is all there. You know how to extract it. You know, in 10, 20 years, since everybody's going to know how to code, everyone's going to pull their own APIs eventually. Right now, you're reliant on some of these third-party systems, but they exist, and a lot of them are free, and they're very good. Yeah, I think that last point is really important. Like, uh, I mean, I, I used to trade like traditional markets, like CME and all these exchanges, but like crypto data is very, very free and accessible. It might not be the cleanest, you might have to scrub everything, but it's extremely free and accessible. And like, have you tried to like just engage with, let's say the CME and like get their data and just like the layer of fee, like different layers of, of fee structures that you need? Like, are you a market maker? Are you like an academic? Are you a researcher? Like, are you like, th there's like 10 different layers and it's extremely expensive and convoluted. Um, and there's none of that in crypto, right? You can just hook up your API to like a Coinbase and just scrub the data yourself. You can, if you're smart enough and you know, like Solidity and different like on you know blockchain, language, you can basically scrub that data yourself and pull it, right? And you can't do that in traditional markets. It's, it's actually embarrassing how wrong equity analysts are on Coinbase's earnings every quarter, because you can literally get their volume you know, every hour on the hour, you have their volume information. And it's a very easy formula what they earn per dollar of volume that goes through since 99% of their revenue comes from you know one source. Like that just shows you again, from an early standpoint, how little these tools are being used despite being freely available. And, and, and that's, that's like part of, that's part of the edge and part of the inefficiency too, is um, it's not that there's no data. It's just that there's no central repository. There's no Edgar, right? It's not, everything does go into Edgar and get disseminated to Bloomberg and Thompson and Cap IQ and everything else and everyone gets at the same time. It doesn't mean that it is not there. It's just everywhere. It's real time and it's fragmented. And like, like it or not to do the job today, you have to be on every blog. You got to be on Twitter and Telegram and WhatsApp, and WeChat, Discord and Reddit and I don't know, a million other things. I'm forgetting. So the information is there. The hard part is it's incredibly fragmented. It's fragmented by medium. It's fragmented by geography. Like what you really have to do is take all that information and figure out a scalable way to do it, bring it into your central place and then figure out, okay, how do I create insights and make actionable decisions based on all the data? I think there was another question. Yes. Um, to what extent do you think uh, decentralization will matter uh, in, the, uh, in the future? Because right now, every DAP is centralized it's running on AWS where it's hooked up to blockchain on Infura Alchemy. Uh, you know, to what extent do you think the market will care that, you know, part of the infrastructure isn't decentralized? Great question. I, I think majority of people really don't care, right? Majority of people just want something to work and they don't really care how it works. But there are, is, there is a growing part of the population who really does care about decentralization, right? You know, everybody here in the U.S. can, you know, joke about what happens in like a place like South Africa or Venezuela or China, right? It doesn't hit home until it happens in a place that feels real, right? Look at the events of February and March of just this year. You had Canada completely restricting the assets of their constituents. You had Russia, you know, a, a few oligarchs decided to just tank Russia's economy for a war. You had the U.S. and, and the EU uh, uh, having swift sanctions on, on banks around the world. Uh, you even had the London Metals Exchange just decide, you know what, we're going to cancel a bunch of trades. Sorry, guys. Uh, all of a sudden, you start to be like, huh, that could happen to me too. Um, 
that's really scary, right? When you start to learn that your assets are not actually your assets, they're somebody else's liability and whether or not you can collect on that liability is now in question. So there is a growing part of the world that really does care about decentralization. Um, it's not for everybody. Again, a lot of people just want things to work and don't really care, but you know, there's a growing, growing uh, movement of trying to move away from that. I, I, it's a it's a spectrum, right? I'm like no one knows. What, I think if you asked everyone on the stage, like even everyone in the audience, like what is some like what is your definition of decentralization? Like you will not get the same answer twice because nobody, frankly, everyone has a different viewpoint. Um, so it's a spectrum. It's somewhere from Amazon runs everything, and there's a single counterpart here, and then it's the other side is like everybody and their mother is running a node. Um, I don't want to run a node. I don't want to be my own bank, and like I work in the space. So you, I think you, there's there's a level of practicality, and I think that that is. I think that trumps everything. Um, and so you don't want something that a few people control, but you don't need everybody and their mother, you know, running nodes either, right? That there's a lot of trade-offs that come with that, right? You optimize for decentralization, you lose throughput, you have higher fees, right? You, you, you struggle, it's always a trade-off. There's some point on that spectrum where you hit the sweet spot, where I think credibly neutral is probably like the term that we, we, we toss around internally the most, where it's credibly neutral, where you feel like no one is gonna pull the rug from you or change the rules on you. Um, but you still get the benefits of throughput, low fees, the practicality to like build the business or run the application that you want to run. Any other questions? Okay. I think that's it. Correct. Oh, no. Yeah, I know. Closing remarks. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, guys, uh, thanks panel. Um, great job, um, everybody. Thank you.